Good morning. Will you turn with me to Mark chapter 2? Mark chapter 2. We're going to be looking at starting with verses 1 through 3. And again he entered into Caperna after some days, and it was reported that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one, one sick of the palsy, who was born by four. Bore up by four, I should say. Lord God, we just thank you that you are God, and that you're in the business of meeting us individually and affecting our lives individually and bringing us forth in a powerful way. Lord, I thank you that you're God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your encouragement and your truth. And we just praise you when we say this in your name. Amen. Now, we've been looking at Mark. And Mark is really about the gospel. Coming to terms with the power, the authority, the purpose of the gospel. Because today, a lot of people really don't understand what the gospel is all about. Uh, we talk about people need to be saved, but people really don't understand what they need to be saved from. A lot of times they think they just need to be saved from some bad situations in their life, when in reality they need to be saved from sin itself. And so we have a lot of people who don't really understand sin. Uh, yeah, they know they do wrong, they know this and that, but they don't understand that that sin is what is going to destroy them. It already is destroying the relationship with God. Eventually it will destroy the relationship with others. Eventually it will destroy them. And so people need to be delivered from sin. Now a lot of times people want it to be delivered in their sin. In other words, from the torment of sin, from the guilt of sin, but they don't want it to be delivered from sin itself. And yet you can't be delivered from guilt and shame of sin unless you're delivered from sin. And you can't stand before a holy God if you're walking in sin, if you're, if you're justifying sin in your life. Now, in order to deal with sin and, and to really receive the gospel, we need to seek Jesus. We need to seek him for his healing, his deliverance, cleansing, and restoration, because that's the core of the gospel, that Jesus came. And that he proved who he was, he died for our sins to, brought, to bring forth redemption, he went to the grave to put them away, he rose again to prove that he was victorious, that he is who he is, resurrection proved that he is the son of God. Now people believe God cannot deal with their sin. Now they admit that sin makes them feel guilty and ashamed, but the sin has a hold on many people. There are sins that hold on to people. We think of addictive sins, such as alcoholism and pornography and all these sins. They have a hold on people. And a lot of times people, you know, the sin, what the sin does, of course, is it appeals to the, the loss of the flesh, and it gets a hold of the affections, and then it gets a hold of the desires and all this stuff. Some sins, a lot of sins do that. And, of course, sin makes us feel good in the initial uh, aspects of, of satisfying it. But as we satisfy it, we become more and more empty. And then we have to go around and do it again to feel that same sort of satisfaction, even though it's temporary. And so we get in this cycle, and sin gets a hold of us because sin gets a hold of our affections. Sin gets a hold of the way we look at things. Sin gets a hold of us. And so a lot of times when we look at God or we think about the sin that besets us that we really, you know, are struggling with, we think, oh, this is too big. This is too big for God to handle. Now, people, sin may be do, too big for you, but it's not too big for God. But the problem is, is that sin often serves our purpose, and we don't want to give it up. So in our, our, our logic, we think it's too big, we can never overcome it. So basically what we do is we act as if God is so unfair to ask us to give it up. That is a real sign of unbelief, people. You don't really believe God. 
You don't believe his character. You don't believe he can enable you to overcome. I've heard people who were uh, big drug addicts that God just took it away from them once they repented. But they had to want to give up. I've heard of other people where it wasn't taken away. They had to walk it through. And I think a lot of times it depends on various things. Only God in his fallen knowledge understands which people need to really be totally set free and which people need to walk through sin in order to be set free. And I think a lot has to do with a person's mindset. The mind truly has to be changed. And if you have justified and given in and you have been blatant in your rebellion, most likely God might be having you walk through it because you need to change your mind. Not just about how you look at that sin, but how you look at life in general. And so that's my conclusion of some of these things. I still don't know. It's, I'm guessing because God is sovereign. Sometimes he takes sin totally away from a person, and sometimes he doesn't. But the reality is the sin is not too big for God. It's not too big for God. And the reality of it also is that a lot of times we don't want sin to be taken away from us. Because we have to deal with our attitude about We have to deal with our will area. We have to make some sound decisions to give it up. Now, as we consider Jesus' ministry... And, of course, when we, we see when, when people found him, they, they were healed, but there's also preaching taking place here. God, Jesus is preaching to these people. At the same time, the preaching, the message, and in this case, the messenger is being confirmed by the following signs of wonders of healing especially. But as we consider Jesus' ministry, we would say, according to the world's standards, he was successful. Look at all these people coming. Uh, to Jesus. In fact, some of the people you hear preaching today say, you know, if you don't have all these people coming, you don't have a successful ministry. That's what the Bible says. Uh, just because you have a lot of people coming to you does not stipulate that you are a great preacher. It may mean that you're a heretic, a wolf, and people are attracted to your lies, but that doesn't mean you're truly of God. And you have to remember that when Jesus when it got down to the real core of it, there was no one following Jesus to the cross. And that's where he required every true Christian to follow him all the way to the cross. And when I see people who are patting themselves out on the back as they say, oh, well, look at all these people, I say, well, are you leading them to the cross of Christ? And you know the reality is? They're telling them how to get around it most of the time. They're telling them what they want to hear. They're tickling their ear. They're trying to convince them they can change their reality of going to the cross, of giving up their sin or whatever they don't want to give up uh, for the sake of Christ. And they're saying, you're a Christian. Belong me. That's what I have to say to them. We will look at Jesus' ministry at this time, not at the end of his walk, to the cross, but we would look at it and say he's successful according to the world's standards. But I want you to know Jesus was not after worldly success, and people who are after worldly success in the name of Christ are heretics. And you better start recognizing that. Because they're not leading you to Christ, they're leading you to a reality that you enjoy so you can tap Christ on and call yourself a Christian. There is so much junk out there, it's hard to find true Christianity. And I have to be honest, the last place you're going to find it is on TBN. Wake up, people. It's time to wake up and get back to what the Bible says about true Christianity. And it's not what's being presented today. And it's not what's popular today. What feeds unchurched people who are still going to hell because they still haven't come to terms with sin. But we can't insult them because we live in a political, correct, hell-bent society. It's time we wake up, church, because we're in trouble. Judgment is hanging over this nation, not God's acceptance of it. His judgment is hanging over the church. And the reality is that Ichabod's written on many churches and many ministries because the presence of God is not there, but a false antichrist religious spirit is. And people would rather buy that and then have the reality of Christ in their midst. 
I want you to understand that. You need to seek out, you need to test, your, test what you're really buying into. Now, Jesus was not after worldly success. He was after souls. He was, he was seeking those who are lost and in despair. That's who he was seeking after. And these souls were seeking answers. They were seeking solutions and hope. Now, you have to realize the age they lived in. The age they lived in is the people had the glory of the Roman Empire. And they had plenty of religion. The Jews had the religion of the Pharisees. And in all appearance, they looked like they had it all. They had great temples. They had great finances, great money, great successes. They had servants. They had slaves. They had everything in the society. They had a great army. But guess what? In the midst of it were people who were still seeking. They were still looking for something. Because all this worldly glitter didn't fill their souls. And all the worldly glitter and all the worldly intellectual pursuits didn't answer their, their questions. And all the activities didn't fill their soul. And people were living in the lots of a Roman Empire today. Only it's at the end of it. And the glory of it is fading quickly. And we're just as ridiculous as they are. But guess what? In the midst of it, <coughs> excuse me, are people who are still seeking. They are still seeking. Because they want solutions. They may not understand what they want solutions to or what they want answers to, but they're still seeking. If you're seeking something today, know that what you're seeking is Jesus Christ. You're seeking a revelation of who he is. And this is what will fill every area of your life. He is your all in all. He will fill everything if you allow him to do so in, in humility. Now we see that there was no more room for people. Verse 2, And straightway many were gathered together so much there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Now notice what he preached them. He didn't preach positive confession. He preached the word of God to them. The true word and spirit and in truth and in context. He didn't preach the virgin church where everybody comes together. He preached the word. And that's where your power and your authority is. You're preaching the word. He didn't preach all the nonsense that you hear today. He preached the word. He preached the word to people who were needy. Now, even though he healed them physically, Jesus was trying to reach into their souls with truth. Now, preaching is a means to stir the soul out of complacency. But the question that we must ask is how important is it for you and me to see Jesus in all of this? Remember, when I preach to you people, I preach to you so the Spirit can penetrate your heart and soul with the truth. So it can raise you out of your complacency and your inconsistency and your indifference to God. So you will respond in repentance and obedience and do what's right. That's why we preach to you. Our hope is that ultimately you will see Jesus. You will see Jesus. You will see his truth. You will see his way. You will see his example. You will see him. So how important is it to see Jesus? If you don't see Jesus, you might as well go home. Let's look at 3 and 4. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, and who was born by four. In other words, he was born up by four people. And when they could not come near unto him, for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed in which the sick of the palsy lay. Our people, here's an example of what it means to see Jesus. 
You don't let anything hinder you. You don't buy any excuse in your life. You don't sit around and say, well, tomorrow I'll get real. Or tomorrow I'll do what's right. Or tomorrow I'll go see him. You do it right then and there. You need to see Jesus. I need to see Jesus. People, there are so many things that can stand between God and us. The world's demands can rob us of time. The world's attractions and entertainment can carry pure desires towards God. How many of you would prefer that sit and expose yourself to the things of the world rather than the things of God? And the more you expose yourself to the things of the world, the more it will do what? It will kill the pure desire for God in your life. People, get up and walk away from the world and walk towards God and prefer God over all the other garbage in this world has to offer because it will kill. It will eventually kill the pure desires you have towards God if you don't choose God over the world. And of course, the bondage of the world can destroy all the life of God in you. Wake up, church. The world is so much in the, in the, uh, the church that we prefer the world over God. We prefer to watch maybe TV or play video, video games rather than sit at the feet of Jesus and see him for who he is. Our priorities stink because they're worldly. We are so full of the world. And then we wonder why there's no power in our prayer. There's no change in our lives or our families. Wake up, church. Wake up. Now, what will we do when, it, when you, what will you do or what will I do when we come up against the op obstacles that stand in our way of seeing Jesus? They may not even be bad obstacles, but they stand in the way. Will you give up? Or will you seek him even more? Please hear me, nothing must, can, or will, or should deter you from seeing and touching Jesus. So what will keep us from seeking Jesus in such a way? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's called unbelief. It's called a lack of faith. Now notice, this man who is ill, it's not his faith. that has brought him to this place. He couldn't come to this place on his own. It was four companions who by faith brought him to this place. They were met with the crowd and they said, there's no way this man needs to see Jesus. He needs to be touched by Jesus. That's why we're here. And so we're not going to let anything stand in our way. So guess what? They, these are people who had faith. These four men had faith. And that faith is what caught Jesus' attention. It wasn't the man's illness, it was these men's faith. Now I want you to understand, the first thing you must recognize by this example is that everything must be brought to God by faith. The Bible is clear that what is not of faith is sin. So if you're not doing something by faith in God, whatever you're doing, what is good or bad, it's sin to God. Because there's no faith. I've been studying the concept of reckoning or imputing or counting something. And it has just opened a whole new world for me of understanding the work of God. That people, God doesn't count our obedience as righteousness. He counts the faith behind that obedience as righteousness. In other words, nothing's righteous to him. But he has said, on the basis of your faith, I will count your obedience, because you're doing it out of faith, as righteousness. As something I can accept. In fact, he counts sin to us. He gave the law so he could reckon sin as sin. So he could show us our need for salvation. And we must reckon ourselves dead. We must count ourselves dead in order to 
be made alive unto Christ. Faith is a way of reckoning something as so. And, and faith is active, so it always obeys. It responds. So these people believed that Jesus Christ was the healer, could heal, and they responded in action. And they brought that man to Jesus so he could be healed. Now, we talk a lot about faith, but I have not seen much of it in operation in the church in America. I don't see much faith. I don't see much faith at all. I see counterfeit faith. faith. If you want to know about counterfeit faith, I wrote a book called In Search of Real Faith, and that talks about some of the counterfeits that are in operation today. And that's why we don't see uh, the effect, because most people are buying a counterfeit faith because they really don't want to walk by real faith. Because it really requires them to trust what they do not understand or what they cannot see. And most of the ridiculous uh, concepts of faith being presented today is faith to change your reality, faith to understand, faith to control your own reality. And that's not faith, people. That's not faith. That's faith in a concept that feeds your arrogance, but it's not true faith. It's not true faith. Now, we are to live by faith. It should be a point of reliance. Emma Murray, who I, I admire his books because he, he had a grasp on things, he says, what we love and live in, we believe in. Let me say that again. What we love, so what do you love today? And what we live in, what do you live according to, we believe in. So if you really believe in Christ, it's because you love him and because you live according to what he says and because you love him and you live it, you believe it. And you believe it because it's confirmed to you. You see, all real faith is confirmed. All real faith is confirmed. But counterfeit faith bring you up to this point where you're in this false reality, you're denying reality around you to believe that you have faith in what? In your concept of faith. And in the end, it sets you up for a fall because it's never confirmed. Because what? It never it can be truly walked out because faith allows you to walk in reality and trust God while you're doing it. Whether it's in loss, whether you're walking through a loss of some type or a sorrow, you are clinging to the rock. And you are believing that God is who he is. And you're loving him. Now we see here that faith serves us the point, our faith is in our point of reliance. And a lot of times when you listen to people talk about what their faith is, it's attached to their concept of happiness and security. And of course, again, we're talking about faith that leaves people empty because there is no substance behind it. Now, we are all to live by faith. So if you trust and you yield yourself to the visible and temporary uh, temporary ways of the world, then you know that you will live an earthly life. And you know what's sad? That's what a lot of Christians are living today. They're living on the earthly plane. They have no concept of true faith. They're living on an earthly plane. Now, if you look to the unseen and the eternal and join yourself to it in agreement, you will live a divine, heavenly life. So I want you to consider 11, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So my hope is in God who is not 
seen, but will be confirmed, my faith will be confirmed, because he is faithful to fulfill his promises to me. So between the earthly and the heavenly stands a choice. And that choice is whether I'm going to believe in God or whether I'm not. Am I going to believe the things of God by faith or reject them in other belief? That's the choice between heaven and earth, between how I'm going to live. So you see, to believe God is a choice of the will, people. To obey God is a means to exercise true faith, and to walk the Christian life out is a point of assurance and abiding in him, which is a point of confidence. Now, the great cause of the weakness of faith today, according to Andrew Murray, is that for many Christians, there's no separation from the world. And that's the big problem today. And we have brought the world in, and we have dressed it up with worldly terms, and we have uh, dressed up the concept of faith with worldly methods and concepts, and we wonder why the church is falling down, and why the church has no power and why families are falling apart and churches are falling apart. That's the reason why. Now, we're reminded that the world rejected Jesus. So here you are, you're not separated from the world, you call yourself Christian, but the world rejected Jesus. So when you are in agreement with the world, it's going to do one thing, it's going to undermine your level of faith in him. Now, for the Christian, faith is the beginning. In other words, it's a choice. I choose to believe what God says, and it's also the end. In other words, my faith in action is counted as righteousness to all spiritual matters. And, of course, at the end of my faith is salvation. It's total deliverance. And people, it's in, it is our faith in him and his word that pleases him. That's what pleases him. He's not pleased because you're doing all these religious activities and going through all your rituals. He's not pleased with that. He's not pleased you're reading the Bible. You're doing that for yourself. That's your food. He's not pre pleased you're praying. That's your privilege. He's not pre pleased because you come to fellowship. That's what you need to do for your own edification. What he's pleased about is active faith towards him, active faith towards his word that results in obedience. And that's what we're told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Let's look at that. It says, But who without faith is impossible to please him? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder for them that diligently seek him. There you go, people. That's what pleases him. We, want, we walk around and say, oh, I want to please God. Well, do you have faith? Well, yeah, do you have faith that translates itself in actions of obedience? You obey because you love God, you know God. You obey because it's in his word. That's what pleases God because that's what he can count as righteousness. Now, faith will cause you, true faith, to separate from sin in the world. It will endure because it will see the invisible and it will see God in a matter. So God meets faith with divine provision as it brings a saint into perfect safety. Let me say that again. God meets faith with divine provision as this faith brings a saint into perfect safety within the will and purpose of God. So where nature fails, faith triumphs, where it follows the Lord. Remember, faith is active. It will follow. It will obey. It will respond. And true faith will claim a promise as it waits and will not perish in judgment. This is a big one. Faith will claim a promise as it waits for it to be fulfilled. Faith occupies and waits. Faith occupies in being right and waits for the rightness of God to be brought forth in, in, in a person's life for his glory and purpose. You need to understand this. 
Faith knows how to occupy and wait at the same time. That's the incredible aspect of faith. Now, these men who brought this man to Jesus would not be deterred because of their faith. Now, notice how Jesus responded in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Wow. Now, here these men brought this guy to be healed. I wonder if they, I'm sure they expected him to be healed physically. But Jesus was more concerned about the spiritual aspect of this man than he was the physical. This man needed to be forgiven. People, we all need to be forgiven. The weight of sin is the greatest bondage of all. And it causes the greatest despair of hopelessness in our life. This sin has to be rolled off of our backs at the cross of Jesus. We must be set free and we must be healed from it. Now, keep in mind, and this is very important, God can only forgive sin. And even the Pharisees, the religious people of that time, knew that. Let's look at that in verse 6 and 7. But there were certain other scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man to speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? They were right. Only God could forgive sins. By Jesus saying that he was forgiven sins, he was saying, I'm God. And of course, anybody who claimed to be God that wasn't God, that was a blasphemy. And it was punished by, punishable by death. And here Jesus was forgiving sins. Now, he wasn't saying, I'm God. Now, he wasn't physically saying that, that I'm God, I can forgive sins. He says, I forgive you. Why? Because he's God. He doesn't have to prove he's God. He is God in the flesh. And so their reasoning in their, in their heart that this man is committing a blasphemy against God. So by Jesus claiming to pardon this man of sin, he was claiming to be God. Wow. Now, how would he confirm his identity? How would he confirm what he said? Well, look at what he does. He asks them a question in verses 8 through 10. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason you these things in your heart? Which is it easier to say to the sick of the, pal of the palsy, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, Excuse me, and take up thy bed and walk, but that he may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, or authority forgives sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, let's go to verse 11, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house, thine house. Wow. Now, Jesus would confirm his healing with the sign of healing. His identity, I'm sorry. Jesus would confirm his identity with the sign of healing. Now, it's important that you realize forgiving sin in his humanity really did say that Jesus was God in the flesh. Now, that is one of the greatest mysteries and it's the greatest miracle of all that God would give up his capacity of God, be formed in the fashion of a servant, in a, in, in, be formed in the, in the shape of a servant, servant uh, I should say, uh, excuse me, I'll get this right, be uh, shaped in the disposition of a servant and be fashioned as a man. Now that is a great miracle. And that shows God's power to do the impossible because he's doing the impossible. He gave up his capacity. In other words, he gave up his authority and power as God. He became a baby in the manger. He grew up. And then he was given all power and authority back as man to carry out the commission of establishing redemption for us. It's that simple. So he confirmed his identity with the sign of healing. Now, the fact that he is God in the flesh shows one of the greatest miracles was accomplished. So in his humanity, his, his power 
power to forgive sins is truly a miracle because he's doing it within the confines of his humanity while stating he retains his identity and nature as God. Now that is a mystery and that is a miracle that can blow anybody's mind. That's why we receive it by faith. He did it. He did it. Today, people don't want to believe that he did, but basically what they're saying is he couldn't do it. That is the way God would do it. Yes, that's the way God did it. He had to do that in order to become the Lamb of God. So he became man in order to offer himself up as the Lamb of God to secure redemption and forgiveness. Jesus confirmed his identity as the Son of God by doing the miraculous. Now notice this again, verse 11 and 12. I say unto you, rise, take up thy bed, go thy way into the, thy house. So basically, this man had to display faith by responding in obedience to what Jesus did, said to him. Imagine, he's laying there for years, and Jesus also sa says to him, arise up. That would take faith on his part. He didn't say, no, I can't. You don't understand. He what? Well, let's look at this. He immediately arose. That's faith. He took up the bed. That's faith. Obedience. He took up his bed, and he went forth before them all. He obeyed. That's act of faith. So we see the faith of four men brought in here. We see the, his faith raising him up in confidence to what Jesus is saying, picking up his bed, and going forth in a new life. And it goes on to say in 12, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. They said, we never seen anything like this happened before. Not in this way. People, please understand. All faith, true faith, results in God being glorified. Not a man being glorified, not a concept being glorified, not an idea, but God himself. And one of the big examples of counterfeit faith is that it doesn't glorify God, it glorifies the person that is laying claim to it, or the ones that are teaching it, these counterfeits. People, all true faith will ultimately lift up God, honor God, recognize God for who he is, and bring glory to his name. Today the question is, do you need healing? Then you need to come by faith. Maybe you need forgiveness. Maybe you need physical healing. You need to come by faith. You need to come knowing that God is who he says he is. He will enable you if he asks or requires you. Lord, we come to you in the name, in your precious name. We thank you for the example of truth in the midst of such delusion. Delusion overtaking this world with this darkness and this deception. And people falling into the delusion because they refuse to fall in love with you. They refuse to desire the truth. They want the lies that tickle their ears. Lord, forgive us because that is the example of worldliness. And in that worldliness, we're tacking Christ on and we have this mixture. Therefore, we can't discern and don't know the truth. And Lord, if there's anybody here that has that mixture, they don't know you, they don't love you, they really haven't received you, I pray by your spirit and out of your mercy you convict them of their unbelief, of their worldliness, of their, their, their lack of priority towards you, Lord. Have mercy upon your people. Lord, only you can bring them into the fullness of your kingdom by your grace. And you'll do it out of mercy. Lord God, we just ask your forgiveness for our worldliness and for our foolishness and for our ingratitude and and wanting life on our terms and wanting life our way Lord we are indeed poor people before you and Lord we just ask for your mercy your forgiveness 
Lord, that we as your children, as you chastise us and you convict us by your spirit of those things which are worldly and those things which are selfish and bring us forth for your glory, Lord. And we say this in your name. Amen.